Thank you so much. And also hitting the recording is important because getting to do this after <laughs> um, on a day where people are working, I want to make sure that they have the ability to come back to it. So let me make sure um, that you're able to see. Are you able to see the slides? Yes. Okay, cool. Just let me know. Can, did I just advance the first slide? I just like to double check before I get rolling. It has been advanced. All right, cool. We are good. I, the Zoom world, you don't want to be giving a 15-minute talk and then realize you totally messed it up later. Really excited to chat. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk through this topic. It's near and dear to my heart. It's near and dear to the work I do every day. And the topic is about experimentation, but I want you to start by not just thinking about experimentation, but thinking about product management more generally. And specifically, I'm going to talk about something called data product management today. And so I want to preface this by saying a lot of these things are my own views. They're based on my experiences. They're not necessarily right. They don't necessarily apply everywhere. The goal here is to start thinking and start thinking about, does this apply to me? How could it apply to me? So one of the most important things that you can come out of this with is not just like being like, okay, I heard some things today. The most important thing is you can think about, does this apply to the environment that I work in? If yes, okay, great. What can I do with that? But if not, think about maybe why it doesn't apply. Are there things that potentially I'm missing and how I'm describing this? Are there things that Maybe you don't understand fully about your environment yet if you're new. I really want you to go back to your own day-to-day -day experience right now because what I'm going to talk about is a framework and some examples, but where it really pays off is, are you able to think about it for yourself? Are you able to think about how this makes a difference for you day-to-day? -day? And so something I'm going to ask you to do in thinking about data products, something that I write about and care about quite a bit, is I've put five examples up here, right? a metrics dashboard, an experimentation platform, the people you may know algorithm, another ranking algorithm, and some like key data snapshots. You could think about that from like a data engineering standpoint. And if I ask you to identify, okay, which one of these are data products? The classic answer that I get is all of them. But the answer that I really want is one that my stats students from when I used to be in academia would be driven nuts by, which is it depends. And so each of these things can be a data product, right? And I would generally think about each of them as a data product. And the one that you're probably listening for today is to talk specifically about experimentation. But when I talk about a data product, to be able to say if something is a data product or not, you need to be able to have a reasonable definition of what that means. And so when I think about a data product, I define it as a product where the data adds the key differentiator or capability from which the target customer benefits. Okay, so a lot of things, we have many products. Each of us work in different product spaces. In some cases, the data is the differentiating experience. In other cases, it may just be complementary. We may use data to understand how someone interacts with the product that would not necessarily be a core data product. But if the data provides a capability and an experience for the customer, that is actually a differentiator and actually provides value to that customer. I think about it as a data product. And so there are things that matter here. One of those is that a customer doesn't always need to know that data is providing that differentiator, right? And you can think about many different types of products that people enjoy where they don't necessarily think about, okay, this is how the data is providing this benefit for me, or, hey, this thing seems to really know me well. They're not thinking about, okay, they must have collected this type of data and they overcame the cold start problem in this way, right? They're thinking about, hey, I benefit from this, and we may view it as data being the differentiator. The customer could be internal or external to an organization, and I think when we talk about experimentation, very often that is internal to an organization, right? Because we're trying to make decisions about products. We're trying to make decisions about, do we take this idea forward? What do we invest in or not invest in? And so because data products are often internal or external, 
the sort of type of requirements, the SLAs, the type of design we use around them can be different. So for what we'll talk about today with experimentation platforms, these things are often really important for informing how we make decisions as a company. They're important for informing how we make decisions about trade-offs between different types of product opportunities. So they may not be as user-facing, right? A client's not interacting necessarily with the platform, but certainly we have to get these experiments right because they do affect what the client is experiencing. That's how we do the fundamentals of an A-B test or any other type of test that we're trying to do. So the thing that is most interesting here is that data product is really about designing experiences with data, right? So data science, product management, and product design. And I think one of the things that I love the most, like my start in industry was really focused in experimentation. And I've seen different flavors of experimentation across companies, across different types of platforms. One of the most interesting things though, is that it is a core competency that companies care about. And the way in which they approach experimentation and honestly, the management of experimentation internally says a lot about how they view data and also how they're trying to behave as a company. So I think this idea of data product, and so to give you a sort of a level set, I'm basically positioning an experimentation platform as a specific example of a data product. And so the title of the talk is really about experimentation product management. But my view is that to be able to talk effectively about that, we need to talk a bit about data product management overall, and then get into the specific example of experimentation product management. So back when big data was a thing that feels so long ago, where like Hadoop was going to be the thing that changed everything. And then 2016, 2017, 18, 19 came along and suddenly like big data wasn't necessarily the thing anymore. But we go through cycles of this. We go through cycles of ML and ML adjacent disciplines. And what data has allowed us to do is it's allowed us to build new product experiences that are demonstrably better than they were before from whether that be like something we do at Stitch Fix with personalization for styling or whether that be like what you're shopping for, the type of digital content you're searching for. Our ability to integrate data into product experiences has made them better. But what's been really interesting is that while at one point the ability to use ML and use data science and products was probably a competitive advantage, a lot of these things have become commoditized over time, right? It's, there's a lot of third-party company, companies building third-party tools that enable people and companies to benefit from machine learning at scale without necessarily having to have an ML expert in the house. And this is very much similar to experimentation, right? In the experimentation world, we have a lot of fantastic startups that have been built off the premise that companies want to be product focused and growth focused, but they don't want to necessarily manage their own platform or manage their own experimentation process internally. And so what's happened is these things have been commoditized is the focus has shifted to how you integrate these capabilities, not the question of if you can do them or not. And in my view, this is really inspired, like this idea of data science inspired product management or data product management for short, which is how do you integrate data effectively into these experiences? It's not about let's shove as much ML and I'm trying not to use the word AI these days. I think it's more reasonable. How do we integrate these into product experiences when they're becoming more and more commoditized over time? And so this focus on data product is not just about, okay, cool, we have data as part of our product. It's also necessitated this idea that we actually think about data as part of the product development cycle. And so I'm not gonna go through each of these questions exhaust exhaustively. We will come back to them in a second. But if you're thinking about a data product, many of the questions you want to ask are things like, who is the customer? Can you define the customer? What benefit do they get? Is that benefit dependent on the use of data or is that benefit potentially just the quality of the UX or the quality of the product itself, regardless of what underlying data they're using? 
I think a really useful question to think about is if you remove the data altogether, would that fundamentally change the customer experience? If your answer is yes to that, you probably have a data product on your hands. And so when we think about assessing a data product, think about how this potentially applies to experimentation, which we'll come back to in a second. So something that you've seen posted and companies, as all of us know, have different ways of titling roles. But this idea of a data product manager can in some places it be titled a technical product manager, ML, be titled a technical product manager for data platform, whatever it may be. We've had a really sharp increase in the number of roles and the importance of these roles internally. And so what was before a shared responsibility, engineering and data science and product tossed ownership of a data product back and forth now has become a much more explicitly owned practice. And so examples of this include like internal facing things like experimentation and metrics, external facing things like recommender systems, algorithms, some of which we use at Stitch Fix. And so it's this interesting skill set, right? You can't just be a data scientist. You can't just be a product manager. You can't just be a product designer. You're in a space where you need to be able to leverage these skill sets as appropriate. And one of the most interesting places this has come together is in experimentation, where how do you become an experimentation product manager? And that's something, as I shift into the back half of this conversation, I want to talk specifically about that. And so I want to give a sense of like, when I talk about experimentation, there's a lot of different flavors of experimentation, but for now, let's just keep it fairly simple. Let's talk about A-B testing internally, right? Many companies want to A-B test. Many companies do it very successfully and at scale. But the premise is that you're able to test experiences against each other. You're able to understand, okay, if a customer is exposed to this experience as opposed to this one, however drastic that change may be, this is the ultimate effect on their behavior, right? And so at a high level, you're trying to iterate on product ideas and using experimentation to be able to actually affect the experience, to be able to actually affect the customer experience and understand the downstream impact on customer behavior. And so very often, the customers for experimentation internally are very often decision makers, right? They're decision makers, and that could be product managers, it could be executives and anyone in between who are trying to understand the trade-offs between doing different things, right? And if you understand those trade-offs, it's really powerful in being able to iterate quickly and make informed product choices, making sure that you at minimum are not doing harm to your core customer. Data is obviously key to this that almost goes without saying, but the idea here is that if we weren't able to use ideas like how do we achieve power, right? What is, what is the effect that we're trying to detect? How do we avoid issues of messing up randomization, right? What you're trying to do is you're trying to make sure that you create a consistent way of doing this for a company, right? And it, as you wanna scale experimentation and scale your ability to do A-B testing, it doesn't, become feasible to be able to do these tests as one-offs anymore, right? You need to make sure that you have a certain level of rigor attached to each of your experiments. And that often can break down very quickly once you get beyond just running a few experiments at a given time. And so experimentation and particularly experimentation platform is a really good illustration of a data product. I think it's also a really good illustration of something that has not always been clearly owned by somebody. And so if you look at some companies, you'll see, okay, they have experimentation product managers. But in many companies, it's an unowned thing where like data scientists use it, engineering helps set things up so that they can do feature flagging and that they can do tests on new features. There's not necessarily an owner. And as you look at how experimentation evolved across many different product companies, 
the idea of an experimentation product manager evolved out of this kind of unowned capability that companies desperately needed to have, right? And so a key question that I think gave rise to the need for this type of work is, okay, what type of experimentation do we need to be able to do in the future, right? We have this thing that allows us to do some experiments. Does it allow us to do the right type of experiments? Does it allow us to manage metrics in the way that we want to? Does it output reasonable results in a way that people can interpret and make decisions off of? Does it create output that is statistically correct? All of these questions start to sound like, okay, these are like product features. And this question of what features does a product need to have in particular, what features does an experimentation platform need to have are exactly why we see a huge benefit from having experimentation product managers. So if you think about what makes a great experimentation product manager, right? I, and so just to take stock of where we are, I've talked through this idea of what is a data product. I've talked through this idea of why are data products a thing? Like why have they come up and become so popular? And I've tried to create this identification of experimentation as an example of a data product. And as data products become more and more critical to business operations and product decision-making, the idea of a product manager for these key spaces is really important. And so my question is, what makes a great experimentation PM? Okay, so we have a need for someone to do this role, but it's really easy to say, it's much harder to do because think about all the things that could be part of being a great experimentation PM. One of those is, do they have experience designing experiments and understanding where you need to have rigor, right? This is often something that data scientists are exposed to or people who are from heavy statistics backgrounds or economics may have experience in. But this understanding of how to design a good experiment and where to implement rigor is not just an automatic. They also need to think about how does experimentation actually play out in a company? Is it valued? Is this something that people just pay attention to? Or are people more skeptical of experiments? If you've run experiments at your company, I'm certain that you've gotten feedback at some point in time where people say, can't we just do this faster? Do we really need to wait? Is that really necessary? And so this understanding of like how to position experimentation's value proposition within the company is really important. This person also has to navigate complex dynamics between organizations that often in some cases play well together, in other cases they may not. You have to get product, data science, and engineering on the same page because to launch a successful experiment, you need alignment between these groups. You can't just have one group off doing whatever it wants to do. And so there's often this like organizational management component to the role that shows up in a big way. So I think the fourth thing that I have on this list is maybe the most important and it builds off of the previous three. There's many things in experimentation that are nice to have. Right, being able to design a certain type of experiment, being able to have automatic power calculations, being able to see like really fancy output and have it corrected statistically so that people are looking at reasonable results every time. There are certain things that are nice to have and certain things that are must have. And that list is not always the same across different companies. And so understanding like what the company needs, what it's trying to do, what it needs to go forward, often depends on where that company is at in its experimentation journey, what the culture is like, what sort of norms have been established already internally. And so this person often has to really make these tough calls about what's necessary versus nice to have. And on top of that, as if these four things were not enough, you have to be able to keep up with like recent developments in experimentation, particularly when you think about, okay, there's like maybe Bayesian op optimization that I can do to be able to do things fast. What are these like variance correction methods I can use for metrics? There's a lot of things happening around experimentation and like being able to take advantage of them is not a small feat. And if that wasn't enough, you have to think about, should we build this or buy it? 
And that question comes up many times in different contexts. So what I wanted to touch on, and I wanna just recap where we've been. What I've basically put forth is this idea is that experimentation is a data product. And because of its importance to how companies operate, it really needs to be managed like one. But just saying that something needs to be managed like a product is not sufficient, right? Very often you need to be able to say, what does a person really need to be able to do to make experimentation successful? And what I've listed here are things that I view as really core competencies to making a great experimentation product manager. And my view is that in terms of what is next, this particular role is going to become more and more important to companies because the demand for being able to iterate carefully on product ideas and do so in a responsible way is not just a nice to have thing anymore, it's becoming table stakes. And if something is table stakes, that means that everyone views it as something that they should be able to do. It doesn't mean that it's easy. And so someone who is in this type of role is able to not only understand the science of experimentation, but they're also able to navigate the engineering work that has to happen, the culture building that has to happen, and really like the product organizational support that has to happen to make experimentation successful. So it's not an easy thing, but I think it's only going to create a much brighter light on whether companies can do this or not going forward. So with that, I'm going to wrap up the talk and I will stop sharing and I'm happy to answer any Q&A that we may have. Let me see. All right, Ava, so you mentioned when you say data product manager needs to have data science skills. So I think it's specifically what I mean by data science skills. So saying data science skills is a pretty huge umbrella of things. I typically think about experimental design. I think about underlying statistical knowledge. So like what distribution is appropriate for a particular type of experiment or test. I often think about if you're going to do experiments on ranking algorithms or personalization, you should be able to think about, okay, what exactly am I testing? How do I test rolling out one ranking algorithm versus another. And so data analytics is certainly important because my view when we talk about analytics is primarily you're looking at the results of things. You're trying to interpret like what happened after the fact. But the design of experiments and being able to understand trade-offs around power, like effect size, things like this, those often don't just come from a data analytics skill set and often require understanding things like how ML works and how ranking works. Thanks, John, for the question. I think in terms of designing an A-B testing platform for scalability, one, this often really does depend on the business. So. If you think about a company that has a lot of traffic, it becomes fairly easy to run different types of experiments, right? You can just be like, all right, I need this many people to be exposed to a, exposed to a treatment. Great. We're just going to be able to do that. And so one of the challenges, though, is traffic. If you're in a lower traffic business or if you have interesting network problems or effects, right? For example, if you think about any place where people are messaging back and forth to each other, you can't simply do just easy experiments within that because if you change the experience for one person, that could affect the experience for another. And so you have to think about things like experimental design once your product becomes more complex. So the issue of how do you deal with traffic? How do you deal with network effects are really important. I think on the scalability side, the question of how do you launch experiments efficiently? it becomes really critical. To launch a good experiment, you not only have to design a good experiment, you have to think about how to do randomization in the right way. You have to think about how are you making sure that the product feature that you're testing versus the existing feature is actually done correctly. And so being able to automate some of those things becomes one of the core issues around scalability is that can you move it from this idea of an experiment to a live experiment? And how long does that take? 
in my experience for like really mature companies that can happen in just a day to two days for other companies that are not there yet it can often take like a few weeks to design the right thing and that lag time can be really impactful depending on where the company is at how high leverage that experiment is there's a lot of other things that go into this but i think those are the immediate ones that come to mind Aaron, thanks for the question. You mentioned, how does this work for early stage startups? So I think what's important in, and, and it, this is a great question because experimentation is a science and the science, you can't just escape the idea of, we have a smaller number of users. So there's a couple of things. On the scientific side, there are methods that allow you to use like prior behavior to be able to essentially shorten the length of an experiment. These things are often applicable to like companies who are mid-stage, not super early stage. And so these methods allow you to do like variance correction, variance, basically ad addressing the variance in different metrics so that it's easier to get to power. You can get to power with fewer number of observations. But to your point, Aaron, one of the most critical things here is that in a, with a small number of observations, you really aren't going to be able to do an experiment at scale. One, because it would just not be feasible. Two, it might take so long that people will be like, I'm not waiting six months for you to run an experiment. In that scenario, one of the things that, that you need to be able to think about is what do you complement experimentation with, right? In some cases, people are like immediately, oh yeah, we could just do like causal inference type of work. And we can just do like observability. That doesn't necessarily do an observational study. That doesn't necessarily work. My, my general principle for early stage is to think about how do you at minimum ensure you're doing no harm? And how do you also capture the upside of doing something? And so my view here is that it often means that you're gonna have to complement some of quantitative data and measures that you have with qualitative data, right? Because also in an early stage startup, it's also very unlikely that you actually know all of the ways that you need to measure user behavior and satisfaction. And so I would treat it as an opportunity. One of those is that, okay, how do we make sure that in the metrics that we have, we can make sure that we're not doing harm or making things worse for the user? But often to capture that upside and the enjoyment or the good things that come out of changing something, you're probably gonna to need to complement quantitative data with talking to people. And this is where things like X research and research teams can be ultra powerful. And I think sometimes big companies are like, okay, we need them. But actually I think a lot of the real value for these research teams comes in smaller settings where you're trying to complement the quantitative measures you have with some qualitative observations. All right, and I think we are about to We're at time. All right, we are at time. Thank uh, you everyone for joining us. All right, thank you so much. We'll follow up with the recording.